It is that the depravity of human life is necessary if we're going to see the greatness of God. And so we sing in our churches about God's amazing grace. But we assert that this grace is amazing only because it saves a wretch like you or me. And we're taught that the proper way to approach this external God is on our knees begging for mercy. What does that do to our humanity? We know how to pour guilt out on our people in such enormous and constant abundancy. Why, we even tell people in sermons that they are responsible for the death of Jesus. What a powerful guilt message. The Protestant mantra, you can hardly get through a Protestant service without hearing in some fashion that Jesus died for your sins. You wretched people. You caused the death of Jesus. And it doesn't escape Catholic Christianity. The Catholic Mass is taught to the people as the liturgical reenactment of the moment that Jesus sacrificed his life to pay for the sins of the world. That's the price that salvation requires. You are the guilty. You are responsible for Jesus' demise. Both are thinly disguised guilt messages. Guilt is the church's preferred emotion of behavior control. Guilt, the gift that keeps on giving. <laughs> now entertain, if you will, the possibility that these two assumptions, one about God being an external supernatural being who invades the world from outer space periodically, and human life as fallen, sinful, lost, and in need of rescue, entertain the possibility that neither of these is still true in the light of contemporary knowledge. Entertain the idea that maybe they're not only not true, but they're not even healthy. That they're quite destructive. That they never lead to wholeness. They only lead to victimization of others. <coughs> and let me suggest to you that that's exactly what modern knowledge has done to these primal assumptions of our salvation-oriented religion. Belief in this external supernatural God who is a being who promises to come to our rescue was a lot easier before the work of Nicolaus Copernicus or Johannes Kepler or Galilei Galileo. Before those three gentlemen did their work, we were quite sure that the earth was the center of a three-tiered universe and that just above that third tier, above the sky, God dwelt. Almost all of the Bible is written from this perspective. What sense does it make to have the story of people who wanted to build a tower so tall that it could reach into the sky where they could be with God if God does not live above the sky? What sense does it make that God can pour out buckets full of manna from the sky on starving Israelites in the wilderness if God does not live above the sky? And what sense does it make that Jesus will return to God by rising up into the sky if God is not just above the sky? And when we postulated this God living above the sky, we could also imagine this God constantly looking down, keeping record books up to date on you, on me. And of course, ready to come to our aid whenever we prayed, ready to rescue us from peril. And what does it mean in a space age? to locate the God who is a being somewhere in space, even heavenly space. If we insist that God is above the earth, 
That really puts God into space somewhere between one planet and another, doesn't it? At least as we understand the cosmos. Well, maybe not. Maybe God's not just above the earth, we say. Maybe God's above our solar system. Well, if you put God above our solar system, that's to put God above our sun. That's a little more comfortable. Until we realize that our sun turns out to be one minor star, not even in the center of our galaxy, about two-thirds of the way out toward the edge of our galaxy, and that in our galaxy there are 200 billion other stars, most of them bigger than our star that we call the sun. Indeed, there are some stars in our galaxy, the Milky Way, that are bigger than the Earth's entire orbit around the sun, including the sun. So that doesn't seem to be quite a good location for God either. So maybe God's above our galaxy, the Milky Way. But then we discover that our galaxy is so large that it would take light traveling at the approximate speed of 186,000 miles per second. It would take light 100,000 years to get from one end of our galaxy to the other. That's why Carl Sagan, who was a friend of mine before he died, could say to me in 1994 when we were at a conference together, that if Jesus literally ascended into the sky, and even if he traveled at the speed of light, 186,000 miles per second, he has not yet escaped our galaxy. <laughs> and then, as Carl was so famous for saying, and our galaxy is one of billions and billions and billions of galaxies, you would think he was going to have a religious experience on you. Well, maybe that's not quite the right place to locate God, just above our galaxy. So maybe God's beyond the universe. We now know that the universe has between 100 billion and 1 trillion other galaxies within it. We now know that the closest galaxy to the Milky Way is Andromeda, which is 2 million light years away. Now multiply that over a potential trillion galaxies. And look how far God has been removed from our tiny little planted Earth. What does it mean to locate God in space, in a space age? Can we still believe in God as a being? If we cannot locate God somewhere, Copernicus, Kepler, and Galileo have in effect rendered our God homeless. It was also easier to believe in this external saving God before the work of Isaac Newton. Isaac Newton, a 17th century mathematician and physicist, suggested that we were not quite right in assumptions we were making. Before Newton, we assumed that anything we could not understand, anything we could not explain, had to be a miracle and attributed to God's supernatural power. But after Newton, particularly in his magnificent work, The Principia, after Newton, human beings had to see a universe that is bound by mathematically precise natural laws. And in those natural laws, Isaac Newton discovered that there is no evidence that these laws are now or ever were capable of being set aside for or by a supernatural being to accomplish a miracle. 